And you can always access the uh, recordings of these workshops, usually by the next day on our on our on our website, both and on our YouTube channel um, here at the Rec Innovation Lab at Miramar College. Welcome to all the students from San Diego State, from Miramar, from the Rec, and um, and all of our guests. We have uh, with us here today a very uh, special presenter. Um, I'm actually really excited to hear uh, Mike talk. We've we've, we've talked uh, quite a bit, him and I, but um, about the presentation and about the. Um, some of the things that the tools that he uses in his program, his entrepreneurship program. I'm just really excited to, to, to hear from him. So uh, Stephen, is there anything that you wanted to add before we get started? Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I know you touched upon how important of a guest Mike is, but uh, Mike is actually the executive director of the Stephen Dorfman Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Cal Lutheran University. And um, before we get started and I hand it off to him, I'm actually going to start a poll while he is introducing himself. Great. So while, while uh, Stephen shares that poll with all of you, uh, Mike, if you wanted to uh, go ahead and share your screen so we can see your slides and then we can go ahead and get started. And welcome, by the way. Thank you, Hi. Tanya. Mm -hmm. to be here. Um, yeah, we're happy to have you. So can everybody see the poll? The, the poll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll use the results from the poll when uh, at, at, a, at a couple of points in, in the presentation. Uh, there are some right answers. I uh, usually say there are no wrong answers. There are some right answers, at least in my mind, that I'll explain, but, but there's no need to like cheat. We're not gonna, we're not gonna grade them. Uh, just just do your best. Question, and then we'll talk about them. Okay, just do, do your best everyone with, with that poll. Um, so you should be able to see it again. I know it popped away for just a second, but now you should be able to see it again. Do your best, what you think of, of, of each of these and uh, answer it the best that you can. Like you said, it's not tied to your name or anything. <laughs> the last one looks like it involves math, but it doesn't really. I did the math for you. You just have to make a value judgment between two choices. Wonderful. And so I'm going to actually read the questions out loud just because they don't show up on the recording, just so everybody who's watching the recording knows what we're looking at. The first question is, what does TAM mean, T-A-M? Is it total available market, total addressable market, either or neither? Um, what does SAM mean, serviceable addressable market, served available market? Oh, I love these. Served addressable market, serviceable available market, any or none? <laughs> SOM? Share of market, serviceable, obtainable market, none. And then number four is, which is better? 10% of SOM of 100 million, SAM equals, that would mean that SAM equals 10 million, or 0.1% of SOM of $10 billion. So the SAM would equal 10 million or they're equal, duh. <laughs> All right, so those are some great questions. So do your best on those. Like I said, it's not tied to your name and you're not being graded on this. Uh, we would just love to love to see where everybody is in their financing. This, these are great questions. These are always always uh, questions that I get when I'm when I'm teaching um, finance and entrepreneurship. So love it. Thank you very much. Um, so this is this is a favorite topic of mine. I I, uh, I have to admit, like like students, when I have an assignment, I work on it just before it's due. So I did these slides last night. Uh, I, I may lose my train of thought every so often, but uh, I very much wanted uh, to redesign the presentation I do about market size estimation because I think it's super important. Uh, for those of you who aren't in, uh, familiar with Cal Lutheran, we're a liberal arts university in Thousand Oaks, just north of Los Angeles. It's kind of unusual to have an entrepreneurship center in a liberal arts university. We do happen to have a business school, which I, I think is part of the reason why. Uh, but um, you can major in anything you want at Cal Lutheran and minor in entrepreneurship. We believe that it's an important part of a 21st century uh, liberal education. I'd be happy to tell you more about that. And and that's and honestly, uh, that's one of the reasons why why I think that we found we found each other while we were introduced to one another. Both both of us we have entrepreneurship programs in places where people don't normally see entrepreneurship programs and maybe aren't really expecting to see those programs, but we're finding that that education is so important no matter what you do. It doesn't matter the, uh, it doesn't matter the industry. Um, it doesn't matter if you're going into small business 
or um, even even if you're going to work for somebody else, entrepreneurship education is so important. So yeah, that's uh, my little uh, two cents there. So it looks like uh, most of the people have completed the poll. If you want to go ahead and just get your get your uh, last questions in there, and then we will um, end the poll and get started. And, and again, if you don't know, it's okay to guess. It's okay to guess. And uh, um, all right, perfect. Should I go ahead and end the poll then, Mike? Would you like? Uh, to yeah, but don't show the results yet. I won't. Okay, we won't. We will end the poll, not show the results, and then we'll let you start the slides. I originally thought about doing them one at a time and I decided we'll just get it all out of the way because it's really just to illustrate a point. Uh, I should also add, I'm an angel investor. I've been an angel investor for about, about 12 years. Uh, so I've seen more mangled market size estimate slides uh, than the average human being. Uh, so, so some of what I'm gonna talk about uh, comes, from, comes from experience. Okay, so should we get started? Let's do this. Let's do it. Let's do okay. it. Awesome. And if anybody has questions, uh, questions in the chat, is that best? Yes. Perfect. I'll keep an eye on the chat box. And Stephen promised me if um, you know what, I have to go pull it up. It disappears. We'll watch it. Me. We'll watch it for you. We'll watch it for you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, so we answered the questions. So let's start with what we mean by market size estimates. First of all, uh, when I talk market size estimates with my students, sometimes the first the, the response I get is market size estimates suck. I don't like them. Uh, they're open to interpretation. Why should I bother coming up with a number that's so unrealistic? Uh, there are no standard definitions. Uh, those abbreviations mean different things to different people. And there's really not a textbook you can refer to that, uh, that tells you what the definitions are. It's too easy. If I can just Google the number, why should I bother? Uh, and um, you can ask two people for market size estimates, they'll give you two uh, dramatically different numbers. So ultimately, if you don't like them, they're about as useful to a startup as a five-year financial projection. Now, I'm in the camp that startup market size estimates rule for these reasons. First, it is an opportunity for you to quantify the business opportunity you're chasing. Uh, if it's well done, it's not just Googling it, it's coming up with a rational argument for why the market size is what, what it is. Uh, one I don't have on here is it gives you the opportunity to rely on work that others have done, to cite sources where they've put in a lot of time and effort into coming up with a market size estimate. So that adds credibility to your pitch. The citations are very important. It sets the stage for a competitive assessment, go-to-market strategy, and I'm going to talk about why that's important. And it's a sanity check for your growth expectations. And we'll get into all of this. So like with most entrepreneurship programs, even this topic uh, comes within the context of the business model canvas. Um, I'm assuming that, uh, that we all know what this is, uh, that we've seen it before. We've probably completed them uh, to uh, the point of exhaustion. Uh, one thing you may not know is that the business model canvas is the result of a PhD dissertation. We've all read that book, Business Model Generation, but there is a, a fair amount of research behind uh, why the business model canvas uh, is so effective. Now, part of the reason why I use the business model canvas when we talk about market size estimates is uh, that um, it's a very important part of that. What we don't talk about with business model canvas uh, often are, is that they're connected, right? So if you have one for your business, your competitors all have a business model canvas, your suppliers do, if you're B2B, your customers do. Uh, if you're in a channel where there's a lot of competition, the, 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 the channel owners do. And all of those business model canvases are interrelated. And you need to be aware of all of them. And they're, um, the business models of the other businesses in your ecosystem contribute to your success, or at the very least, uh, are a uh, are competitors. So it's important to understand that there are all of these business models going on in an ecosystem. So why do we? Why do we? Uh, when I look at market size, to me, market estimating market size is a volume estimate. It's an estimate of how big are all those business models. The business model canvas always looks the same when you're completing it. The PDF is always the same, whether you're a multinational corporation or whether you're 
you're, you're just starting out. Uh, so a market size estimate uh, helps you understand how big the opportunity is. The financial potential of your startup's opportunity, how big it is. It also helps you refine the business model canvas. When you start forming hypotheses about, uh, about what's in your business model, as you invalidate hypotheses, there might be an effect on your market size estimate. As you invalidate hypotheses, uh, there might be an, uh, or if, as you validate hypotheses and create new ones, it changes the size of your market size estimate. If you validate all your value propositions, all your customer segments, and there's nothing left to, value, to, to validate, and your, and your addressable market size is, um, is still small, then that means you need to go back to your business model canvas and, um, and rethink whether you've got the right combination of value propositions and customer segments. So it's an important part of that, that scientific method, that process of evaluating your business model canvas. When we talk about market size, we're really talking about measuring it in two ways. One is money, uh, whether it be dollars uh, or, or, or euros or yen, or, or depending upon the size and scope of your market, it may be different. And then units. Uh, whether you're counting people or companies, decision makers, uh, if it's a consumer business, sometimes you're, you're, uh, you're, uh, you're measuring consumption. So hopefully this all makes sense. But it, the one thing you remember from this slide is you're quantifying, you're measuring the volume of your business model canvas. What's the size of the opportunity? Okay. Now for the fun part. Uh, when we make these measurements, We've we use terms that uh, have kind of become industry standards, but not really because, and this is something, and Tanya and I have had this conversation. This is on academia. This is on those of us who study entrepreneurship to start to create standards for what these terms mean. So the first one that most people hear, because if you, you, you see it in pitches, you, you hear about it everywhere. You hear it about it on CNBC. For publicly traded companies is this, this uh, three-letter acronym TAM. So let's, Stephen, let's put up our, our uh, survey results and see what the audience believes is the... Okay, so let me go to the next slide. TAM actually means total addressable market. So if you saw the results, 71% said available. I will remind you that I work at a liberal arts university. Words are important to us. And the exactness of what those words mean inform what you should be doing when you're, when you're living up to uh, an acronym. The A actually means addressable, not available. And the way it was explained, I heard this years ago, uh, the way it was explained to me is that available is a more passive word. It's like you're going to the market, uh, the marketplace buffet and you're going to pick the one that you want and that it will be made available to you. Where addressable is a more active word. You're identifying a market you wanna pursue. Uh, this is something that you think you can address with your products and services offering a particular value proposition. It's, it's not that available is necessarily wrong, necessarily wrong but addressable is a better, uh, is it the meaning of addressable is more uh, is more directly related to what we're doing when we're when we're doing a TAM estimate. Hopefully that makes sense. If it doesn't, and, and again, the results do not surprise me. If uh, if you Google TAM, you'll get results for both reliably, because I did it last night and and uh, and the results were not what I expected. Okay, so what do we mean by TAM? This is, I put up that, that slide of all these interconnected business model canvases. That's the estimate of all of that, of not just your business model, but all of the business models that are related to yours. So if we're going to define it in terms of the business model canvas, it's the sum total of the revenue streams for all of the customer segments of all of the businesses connected by their business models. Um, practically speaking, if I were to give you examples of, of uh, TAM sizes or, or of markets that we would estimate TAM for, it would be uh, the travel industry or, um, or education or, uh, or um, 
uh, auto automotive manufacturing. They're usually very big and very complicated. And no one expects you to, uh, to capture all of a TAM, but it sets the stage for uh, the industry you're playing in. From an investor's perspective, it gives them an idea that if they have their investors always have at their back of their minds, what's my risk mitigation here? If this business model that the startup uh, is so convinced is going to work, doesn't work, are there other opportunities for them to pivot toward? Uh, so ha being playing in a TAM that's substantial at least tells, uh, tells an investor that there are other opportunities you could pivot to. It's the easiest to estimate. This is one where you probably can find a number on Google most of the time. However, it is super important. I'll keep mentioning, mentioning that citations are important. Googling TAM for the travel industry will get you a lot of numbers. Uh, you want to find the one that uh, comes from maybe an industry group or comes from a consulting a consultancy that was paid to develop an authoritative number, not, um, not someone who put up a TAM on their Instagram account and doesn't have any citations for where they got the number from. Uh, the more authoritative your citation, the better it sounds in your presentation. Okay, so that's Tam. Next one up is Sam. So uh, let's put those back up. So the the uh, the numbers are wow. They're serviceable, available market. That was number one. Interesting, and addressable too. So the. the uh, the answer, and I, I'm going to try to avoid saying right. I have my idea, idea about what's right, but the answer I was taught 10 years ago was that SAM means served addressable market. Addressable for the same reason that it's addressable in TAM. Served meaning serviceable kind of works, but served uh, is a little more direct. We like words that are direct uh, and, um, and active. Uh, so it means served addressable market. Now, what, that, what it really is, is kind of a refinement of TAM. So when you're estimating TAM, all of that, all of that revenue that you're totaling up uh, is not revenue that you can address directly with the products and services you have now. No one expects that. SAM, that's really what the number is about. If you, it's more of a, where, where TAM is something that you can usually find online, SAM is something that you very often have to build an estimate of yourself. Uh, and it's really about the entire population of your customer segments, to which your value propositions apply, totaling up what they are, multiplying the, uh, that by the, the, um, the, the revenue that you could expect to gain from that population of customers. Uh, you total that up, and that's your SAM. So SAM is a more direct estimate of with the product you have or the product you expect to have in a reasonable amount of time, how can you monetize that? Two very different numbers for two very different reasons. TAM is about setting the stage for the industry you play in. Uh, SAM is more about what is the immediate reve revenue generating opportunity for my business? Served addressable market. Okay, next. So uh, this is my favorite. Tanya and I had a laugh over this. This is my favorite. So let's put the results back up. So good, good. Uh, SOM does not mean serviceable, obtainable market. If there's one that gets me, that gets the hair on the back of my neck to stand up, thank you, Tanya. Thumbs up. Uh, it's this one, serviceable, obtainable, and I. I, I um, where with Tam and Sam, I'll, I'll allow for a little bit of flexibility in, in the meaning. I do not allow any flexibility for this one. There is no such thing as serviceable, obtainable market. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of like a really bad game of telephone that's gotten out of hand. Um, and I'll explain why. When I was, when I started out angel investing and, and uh, a, a, a a founder would get to their market size estimate slide. They'd show TAM, they'd show SAM, and they'd show SOM. SOM always meant share of market. A very different thing than 
than estimating uh, market size. This is an estimate of, of the market size I've defined, what can I, what share of that market, what percentage of that market can I reasonably expect to get to uh, achieve for my, for my startup? Uh, so it's not a, it, this isn't a volume estimate. It's a, it's, it's your, it's your, um, it's your slice of the pie chart. Uh, but I think over time, because we spent more time talking about Tam and Sam, uh, the, the, big, the big pivot here was that we used to require early stage startups to do five-year revenue estimates. And we've gotten out of the habit of doing that. I still think it's a good idea to just go through the thought process, but, um, but we don't require it as much as we used to. Uh, we used to use share of market as a sanity check for your five-year financial projection. If you did a five-year financial projection, regardless of how unrealistic was, it was, and it was a small percentage of your SAM estimate, uh, then that's a yellow flag to an investor. Well, that, that their plan doesn't align with the, with the size of the opportunity. Uh, or you come up with a five-year revenue projection that's twice your SAM, that's completely unrealistic and would require you to pivot almost immediately uh, and to take more of uh, the TAM into your SAM. Uh, once we stop doing financial projections, and maybe this is, is, is uh, circumstantial, we stopped asking for, for share of market estimates. And I think there's still a reason to do it because it is a nice sanity check and it is a, it is a way for investors and for founders to triangulate whether the number that you're coming up with for your market size makes sense, okay? Now, Years ago, we don't really ask for this anymore, but years ago, we also used to ask for target market. And this in essence was a demographic, uh, an, a demographic refinement of your SAM. Okay, if your SAM is all the revenue that's available to you, where do you think the best opportunity is? Very often it, it would be a geographic area. Like if I think my, my SAM for the, the United States is 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 a hundred million dollars? I think ten million of that is in L.A., and that my target. I'm going to target L.A. first because, or San Diego. I live in San Diego, and that's what I can reasonably do. I think that serviceable, obtainable market kind of became what target market always was, uh, and it's something I see it more rarely uh, in. Um, in pitch decks, but uh, if, it, if it's, uh, and I'm gonna talk about the labels in a little bit as well, because they're, they're somewhat fluid, but that's what we mean by target market. Uh, some folks call this a beachhead market. Uh, Bill Allette at MIT uh, doesn't really use SAM. He, he likes using TAM, uh, but he'll talk about beachhead market, which market uh, is the most accessible to you. And we kind of mean the same thing, not exactly, but kind of. So if you ever see target market, that's what we mean, okay? So those are the definitions. Thank you for bearing with me with the questions. There was one more question in the poll that we're gonna to get to. So I'm gonna talk about some tips, tricks, and techniques when you're estimating TAM and SAM. The first one is which one to use. Um, it really depends on your story. Uh, you could decide to use one of them. Uh, sometimes I see pitch decks where the founders don't differentiate between TAM and SAM. They just talk about the addressable market. Uh, they may have a really aggressive plan uh, to attack the entirety of the TAM and uh, don't want to differentiate. Uh, if the startup is further along, if they have a product, if they have product market fit, if they have some revenue, they may start think, talking about, um, about share of market, about what it is now and what it could be. Uh, some founders define multiple TAMs they decide to segment their markets into sections and uh, define a TAM for each and then fold them into one SAM that summarizes what the, the direct revenue opportunity is for each of those TAMs. Uh, what's most important to remember is that TAM is the big picture, SAM is the more immediate opportunity, target is the right now opportunity. And what's really most important is that with all this confusion in the definition of terms, it's not just confusion amongst 
uh, founders, it's confusion amongst investors. So understand that uh, the investors have in mind what you mean, their, their own definition of what you mean uh, by these, these, uh, these terms. And that's probably just as important as for you to define what you mean so that they know. Now, the next question is, is bigger always better? We have this discussion a lot. Sometimes with students, I'll, I'll, uh, if, if you come up with a, 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 a TAM estimate of, of $5 million for your opportunity, that seems like a really big number to you. I can tell you from an angel investor's perspective, uh, it's really small. Uh, and then the other, uh, the other question that comes a lot is when, if you're looking at share of market, uh, the interplay between the size of your TAM and SAM uh, and uh, your market share. So uh, this is where the fourth question on the survey comes in. Steve, if you could put that survey up one more time. Uh, so if, if you're a founder and you've got two, two, um, two ways to pitch your, uh, your, uh, your share of market, which one's better? A 10% share of market of a $100 million SAM, which is $10 million. I think I did my math right. It was late last night when I got to this. Or a 0.1% share of market of a $10 billion SAM, meaning you've got big dreams and you're, you're going off to chase that and, um, and uh, damn the torpedoes, you're going to figure it out one way or another. These results are really interesting. So we've got their equal duh, which is not wrong. Uh, I will tell you where I lean as an investor and you can decide. And I can also tell you about one pitfall I see a lot, not just with students, but with practicing entrepreneurs. I lean toward a 10% share of market of $100 million, Sam. Because that 10% is important. Uh, if you've been able to convince that much of your addressable market, of your value proposition, that's really compelling evidence that you're onto something. And you can make that, and especially if, if the $100 million SAM is part of a $10 billion TAM, uh, and that there are opportunities for you to expand and to pivot, then I would rather see the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the traction. Now here's the 0.1% the, the, the share of a $10 billion SAM isn't necessarily wrong, but time frame is important and the way you present it is important. And there's a huge pitfall here that founders run into, uh, that run into with this particular number. If you're just starting out and you think you can get that 0.1% in the first year of, of business, that's a pretty good start. But the pitfall is, and what, what I hear founders say is, well, if I could just achieve 0.1% over the next five years, and I have a $10 million business. And I can tell you from experience that does not happen for these reasons. First, if there is really a $10 billion opportunity and you're the first one to find it and you move slowly, which I would argue that, that a $10 million business in a $10 billion market, if that's all you are after a few years, you're moving too slowly. The worst thing that could happen Best thing that could happen is the market's still ignoring you and you still got time. The worst thing that could happen is you wake up a whole lot of big companies that didn't realize there was this big opportunity and they start offering comp competing products. They may not be better as yours, but they can keep their prices artificially low. They can support it with a lot of marketing and they're going to spend you out of business and take that market for themselves. So if you think you have an opportunity like this, the best thing to do is, is come up with a more aggressive plan uh, or to, um, to find a target market that's smaller to do your experiment uh, in plain sight where uh, other companies, other competitors that are watching. Oh, the, the second thing is that better funded competitors figure it out and they move faster than you do. So um, in my mind, the 10% share of a smaller SAM is better provided that you can communicate that there's a bigger TAM to be had. We're definitely not equal in the, in the truest sense of the word. 
Oh, sorry to interrupt. It looks like we have a question in chat that's related to this. Um, what is your opinion on the blue ocean strategy? Good question. I'm going to come to that in a later, a later slide. So uh, thank you, Martin. Uh, and, um, and I will cover that uh, probably in a slide or two. Ah, next slide. Perfect. Good straight, man. Um, something else to keep in mind about market sizes is that they're dynamic. They don't stay stag stagnant most of the time. It, it can happen, but, um, but most of the time markets are either expanding, contracting, or, or staying the same, M mostly expanding or, co or contracting. Um, now, what are the business app, uh, um, model implications of that? So let's start with blue ocean strategy since that was, uh, since, since uh, you asked that question at the perfect time. In my mind, Blue Ocean Strategy, I haven't read the book, it's on my bookshelf. Blue Ocean Strategy is about finding this new opportunity that was undiscovered. In business model canvas terms, what that means is you've identified a unique value proposition for a, for a, for a customer segment in a particular kind of channel with a particular kind of relationships that's totally brand new. So when you're estimating market size for this kind of opportunity, it's maybe going to be much bigger than what we had thought in the past. And it's very important uh, when you're doing a blue ocean kind of opportunity to show the market as you see it now and the market as uh, you uh, think it could be with your value proposition. So Uber is a good example of this, right? Who would have thought that that, that there would be so many other reasons to hail a, a ride or that uh, people would be willing to, um, to do a side hustle with their own cars to take people places and to deliver things. Uh, in the context of the way that we looked at those, those, those addressable markets, uh, Uber was resetting what the size of the market was. In that case, uh, when you look at share of market, um, you're, a, a lot of your, the pie chart for share of market is going to be unclaimed, right? Uh, there, are, there isn't going to be anyone uh, tackling that particular, that particular market. So that's where when you're estimating market size, you're probably gonna have to do a little more work on what is the, what is the market size truly because there are so many new customers and so many new value propositions. Martin, I hope that answered your question. Um, so other business model implications. Uh, when you start thinking about, about uh, market sizes in motion, it raises other questions, right? If you're, in, if you're tackling a stagnant market where it's not growing and your value proposition is unique, but it still competes with a value proposition of, of, of a, co a competitor, you're stealing customers, right? You have to go to that extra effort to convince them that the way the big company is doing it is ineffective and that you can do better for your customer. Uh, so now you're thinking about how do, I, how do I peel that customer away from someone else? And if you have to do that, uh, it has an effect on your customer acquisition costs. It costs more to do that. Uh, and it might have an effect on the lifetime value of the customer that you acquire because you're, you're more price sensitive. Uh, in some ways, contracting markets are a better opportunity than a stagnant market because, um, because in those kinds of markets, competitors are running for their door, the doors. They're looking for ways to pivot. The cu customers are leaving and they lose sight of the fact that uh, there's still a good revenue producing opportunity uh, in that particular market. How many people here are old enough to remember fax machines? The very first time I saw a fax machine, it was in a room with a locked door where only so many people had access to it because it was new and unique and interesting. Uh, now you don't see fax machines ever. Uh, and um, yet faxes are still important to certain markets. Uh, lawyers and uh, real estate, uh, they have to fax and they don't necessarily do it with fax machines anymore. They do it with scanners and uh, an email. But there's a company up in Santa Barbara called J2 Global that has made a, a, a business model out of acquiring little companies that served particular mark, uh, customer segments in that industry and still rely on facts. Do they expect to be in that business forever? No, 
they have a multi-sided business model where they, they extract as much revenue out, out of those customer segments as they possibly can. They take that revenue and they acquire other companies that are doing new and interesting things that are related to the same customer segments. So they're finding new value propositions for those customer segments. Um, so sometimes a contracting market can be interesting and attractive if you have a second act. So some other helpful hints, I'm, uh, I'm looking at this. Am I okay on time? You're still good on time, we're, we're still okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, when you're estimating market size, if you're in the US, it's okay to use a US only estimate. That's usually what's expected unless you're chasing an international opportunity then it needs to, to be a bigger market size estimate. Market size projections are usually pretty big numbers. Don't let big numbers scare you, but they have to be reasonable. And when you're thinking about market share, think about five years out. I'm, I'm not asking you to do a market size projection, but at least do this. When you come up with a SAM estimate, ask yourself, is it reasonable that I can achieve five, 10% of that, of that estimate in five years? Not that I have to explain exactly how I'm going to do it now, but if there's not a sanity check, uh, you should go back and revisit what your market size estimate is. Um, so if you're lucky, you'll, 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 you'll find an industry uh, that did a study that fits your business model. And I'll talk about some data sources and I'll show you an example where, that, where that, that's possible. If you're not, then build a map of your market. Uh, spend some time completing business model canvases for your, your competitors and suppliers and uh, build a, a, a ground up kind of estimate. Uh, it's very important to differentiate facts from assumptions and from your extrapolation algorithms. It's okay to guess, but you should explain how and why you guess. And run multiple scenarios. Don't just come up with a number and be happy with it. Test it like you would your hypotheses on your business model canvas. When it comes to data sources, um, I get this from my students a lot. Statista is this, this online service that does a really good, they have a really good freemium model where they have a lot of data that's available for free. Uh, they have a paywall. Uh, Cal Lutheran about two years ago decided to get a Statista uh, subscription and uh, our students have access to the entire Statista database. So if, you're ever, if you ever uh, cite a TAM for Statista and then it has a button you have to press that for $600, you can have all the details for, for that estimate. Uh, our students are fortunate to, to be able to press that button and not be charged for it. Uh, so uh, Statista is a really good source of market size estimates. Uh, and if, um, if your school has a subscription to it, it can be a phenomenal source. I can tell you that from my perspective, my students' market size estimates have gone up in quality since we've had this subscription. Some other data sources, rather than just Googling it, uh, go look at some of these as... Um, as potential data sources. I'll just, I, I'll just cite some, like if you have a B2C business, the Bureau of the Census has an incredibly rich data source on who lives in this country and how they're divided def demographically. That's a great source, especially for SAM estimates. If you have an idea of what you can expect to charge, just go to the census and come up with a number there and put a little spreadsheet together that gets you to SAM. Um, all of these consultancies are, retained by industry groups to come up with estimates. They're usually, uh, they're usually uh, optimistic for whatever industry group asks them to do it, but they're a good place to start. And if all else fails, Google's fine, but watch the citation and don't just accept it as truth, test it. And if you're gonna read one book, uh, I put this book up, this is a serious book. Uh, Harry Frankfurt is, a, is a, a, a professor of economic philosophy at Princeton. Uh, this book is as boring as you will ever read. It is not meant to be funny. Uh, he, he first wrote a book called On Truth, and then I'm sure he came up with the title for this one in a Princeton pub. Bullshit is a real thing. Uh, and uh, it is a very, not just for market size estimates, but for your entire pitch. Uh, the listener, the investor knows that you're speculating. Absolutely. They don't expect truth from you. What they expect from you 
is uh, reasonable. So as soon as you put up a number, as soon as you put up a, a statement that is so outlandish, that is so unbelievable, that it's difficult to keep your mind in the story, you just cross the bullshit line. You have to stay on the reasonableness side of the line. So I encourage you to read this, but it's not very, I, Harry Frankfurt probably owes me a commission because I put this up all the time. Uh, my son has a copy. Uh, he rereads it, he's read it more times than I have. Uh, but what's most important when you're coming up with market size estimates is that it makes sense in the context of the story you're telling when you're doing your pitch. I love this. Thank you, um, by the way, for, for sharing that. One of my favorite things that I ever get out of these workshops is the uh, is book recommendations. And I have in all my classes, I share a list of just the, the entrepreneurs and the entrepreneurship educators and all the books that they've recommended. Oh, so I can't wait to read this one. Can't wait to read it. So there, it, it, the issue here is there are no textbooks for this particular topic. Right. A lot of what you Google on this topic is just wrong or <laughs> wildly inaccurate. Yeah. So I'll, I'll share one quick example with you. This is from a, a startup I used to work with uh, it's dead. So, uh, and I can tell you all about why, uh, why our market size estimates were horribly wrong. Uh, this was a group res was a startup that was meant uh, to facilitate group reservations. If, um, if you have a group that wants to all stay at a hotel, then, uh, or a group of hotels, this app was about enabling that. Uh, the uh, our TAM estimate I, so this was one where I, I used this one because it was it was easy and I was lucky. Uh, the travel industry had hired Price Waterhouse Coopers. They paid them, I'm assuming, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, to come up with a size uh, of um, to estimate the size of uh, travel and entertainment spending just for meetings, not for the whole travel industry but they estimated that it's a $113 billion business. I, in, in my research, I realized there were a ridiculous number of industry groups that, that, that go somewhere to have meetings. This is pre-COVID and we'll see how this plays out post-COVID, uh, but there's even an industry group for industry groups. It's that out of hand, but part of the analysis, and by the way, I found this PDF online, the whole thing, the whole study. I think it was shared by an industry group. Of that $113 billion, $35 billion of it is spent on hotel reservations. Uh, and of that $35 billion, $5.3 billion of it, about 15% is spent on commission, the hotels spend on commissions and fees, the middlemen to bring them hotel reservations. And that come, the reason why it's split up, I won't go into the details. It comes from a lot of sources. It's probably shrunk over, over the years as hotels have gotten better at taking reservations online. But this is the way we presented uh, our addressable market sizes uh, to, um, to investors and, um, and, and, and to prospects as well. Uh, now we weren't super successful at raising money. One of the reasons was these numbers are just ridiculously large and we had a hard time proving uh, that, um, that they were real. Even though we had PWC behind us, uh, we, also, um, we also underestimated the hotel's uh, uh, interest in collecting this revenue for the capturing this revenue for themselves. Uh, and, it, and it never really took off. But in this case, it was as simple as finding an example. So, um, so I encourage you to do that, not just Google. If you're, I know Cal Lutheran, this is, it, it's a little hard. Our, our library still wants to be a library, uh, but they have some incredible databases that you can use uh, to, um, to uh, validate, uh, to find data. Mm. So, so that's the presentation. Thank you very much. Wonderful. We've Thank you. We've got a little bit of time. No, that was that's excellent. I, I I think this is so so important. I you know we've talked about this before, but this is an I issue for entrepreneurs addressing um, addressing the unknown and and um, and being able to support when 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 they make assertions about about market size about their TM Sam Psalm. So this was really helpful. Uh, did we have any uh, questions from uh, Stephen from the audience? Doesn't look like there was any questions in the chat. 
Okay, so uh, anybody, have you have any questions? Um, you can go ahead and just shout them out now, and we're we're still good on time. We still have a, a, about ten minutes if we need to address any of the questions from the audience. And if you think of it later, my LinkedIn profile, my email address are on this are on the screen. But please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you, thank you so so much. There, you I'll know, share uh, the slides too. Thank you. I was going to uh, perfect. Okay, I'll then if we, we can share the slides, we can put them. Um, attach them to the to the recording that we put out they'll be available on our youtube channel which we'll go ahead and put in the chat and um and i will i'm sure there's going to be some questions that come um a little bit later but any other questions uh, directly from the audience does anyone have any <laughs> so that's one of our student founders who's putting things in here. So um, I, I, I do have a, a I see a few questions coming up um, here uh, one about um where you should uh, go, you know, data is always difficult in entrepreneurship because we're emergent. And uh, do you have any recommendations for market data on emergent markets? I, I do. And in, in fact, I, I teach a course on global entrepreneurship. So uh, there's a, um, an ongoing study called the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor mm -hmm. that, uh, that Babson runs. They, they, uh, they, they look at particular countries around the world, mostly developed, but also undeveloped. Uh, Looking at economic development types of um, types of data specifically related to entrepreneurs, they produce a report every year that's very good. Uh, the, the World Bank and I think the OECD have a really good database of um, statistical data about business in countries around all all 200 and some countries around the world. There's some really interesting nuggets that geeks like me like like the amount of time it takes to incorporate which can be wildly different. And then there's another, uh, another um, two other projects. One is called the Startup Genome, which is more about creating the next Silicon Valley, uh, not so good for, for emerging markets, although they're getting better. And then another website called Startup Link that catalogs startups around the world, not necessarily market size data, but for what's going on. Awesome. So there's a couple other, um... Uh, there's a couple other uh, comments, uh, thank you, um, and, and questions there. So um, how much weight do you, would you put in secondary sources um, for illicit sectors such as cannabis, cryptocurrency, et cetera? Oh, my video's not answering. Do you have any, any thoughts about that? Yeah, okay, so you could look at cannabis as kind of a blue ocean, blue ocean opportunity in a sense. Because it's it's a, it's a if you look at all of the things it can do, uh, it's it's how you it's how you serve it up. Looking at how many people would be interested in it, uh, it you know, people my age still look at it as they're always going to look at it as illicit in the back of their minds. Um, I I've seen so many cannabis pitches. Uh, <laughs> ultimately, I see an agricultural business married to a retail business, and they're the two least interesting types of businesses to an angel investor who's looking at high growth. If someone can convince me there is a therapeutic, I know lots of people who, who rely on CBD, but I see precious little university research that backs up the efficacy claims. And I'm not saying they're not real, but having proof would be good. We always want proof, right? Investor, yeah. I mean, you have to think when what you're asking from people is you're asking them to take a risk on you. And so they they, they need uh, evidence before they're going to take a risk. And so something so new like that, it's difficult. So I, I agree. And then I Ray, Ray had that comment about the banking. So because it's federally <laughs> illegal. Well, yeah, Mike and I will both understand this is that as investors, mm -hmm. you're not going to put something into... Uh, you know, if you come to somebody and ask for money and you can't even deal with the monetary system in the U.S., what the heck are you going to do? Crypto. Yeah. Right? So <laughs> there's, yeah, okay. I, I know there's a lot of, there's, there are a lot of cannabis businesses in San Diego, um, uh, Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara, same thing. And I've, I've heard stories about, uh, about growers showing up uh, at the, the, the bank in Carpinteria with a suit, literally. Money. suitcase with cash in it okay. i've seen it yeah that's not to say it's that easy to make money <laughs> but uh, just, yeah when you can't put it in the bank what are you going to do right, right. but for cannabis and for crypto that's really not a market size question it's a value proposition question right. and mm -hmm. a channel question and a customer segment question prove to me that it's better and, well, and mike hi hi i'm benjamin uh, hi thank you uh thank you for your talk 
Uh, I was just wondering how would I use the numbers to get to get me more inspired in my business concept um, to, 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 to sort of like a, a, a good circle, a good, good uh, circle. I, I, th I like target markets for that. Okay. I, I think it helps to have a number that looks achievable. Yeah, because I would, yeah, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. A big TAM is great, but it's, it's also overwhelming. Times, but a target market, you know, like start with San Diego. <laughs> that's why we. That, that's why we. 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 We always start um, it, in the entrepreneurship center and in my classes by looking at that. That the first early adopters, right? Looking at the first segment that we can realistically capture, and the reason we do that is because that's something that people can grasp. And I was wondering when you were sharing that story, Mike, about that very, very large um, market. You know, sometimes it does help with the way that we frame things, right? Frame it a different way. It's something that's easier for people to grasp. And and even if it's true, sometimes you have to make it so that they can um, digest it and, and feel comfortable with it. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to give my anti-investor commercial too. Mm -hmm. I think we get too hung up in raising money from outside investors. Mm -hmm. The cheapest, best source of capital for your business is the revenue that it generates. It costs zero. Uh, you don't have to take investors on. I, I know I raised a TCA it? member too. I've been a TCA. A lot of the, a lot of Tech Coast Angels members, um, never took a penny of venture capital and a penny of angel angel capital. They built their companies with their own sweat and their own hustle, and maybe it took a little longer. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't go seeking investors, but you shouldn't assume that you have to have an investor to be successful. Right. right. And you de oh. definitely don't want it early. You definitely don't want it too early. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Do it. Did, did I cut somebody off there? No, no, no that, that's great. Th thank you, Mike. You're welcome. So wonderful. And I'm really, uh, I'm excited. I'm actually going to, I'm going to add your book to my book list too. And I'm going to share that with you. Um, and I'm excited to read that one, uh, uh, the recommendation. And I wanted to thank everybody for, for being here. Uh, we're just about out of time. So I want to pass it back to you, Mike. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us uh, or, or to take us out with? No, it, it, st since we're still in, hopefully coming out of COVID soon, but still in the age of COVID, there are all kinds of online events. Uh, we have a co-working space in, um, in Westlake Village called Hub 101. I'd encourage you to go to hub101.la and uh, join our email list so that when we do online presentations uh, that, um, that you can join in. We do, uh, we do one or two a month. Oh, and Kristen, Kristen, Bell is, Kristen runs Hub 101 and she just put our, put our link in there. So uh, please, Thank you, uh, Kristen, for sure. there's Kristen. Uh, but uh, you're always welcome to join us. If any of you are ever in the area and you need a place to work, we're, we hope to be opening imminently. Oh, I can't wait. We'll just wait for it. We're in LA County. Uh, wait. We, we need to get to red. Yeah. Awesome. Wonderful. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll definitely, we'll, we'll follow that link. We'll join. Thanks for sharing that, Kristen. And again, Mike, thanks for being here. Thank you all um, for coming and um, another, just another great workshop. Thanks. All right, everybody. We'll see you again soon. Have a Thank good one. Thank you so one. much, Mike. Next. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike.